live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you very much for joining us. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom, as we do every weekday. Starting at 1 o'clock, and we go throughout the afternoon. We cover a wide range of topics and get to do some longer-form interviews and segments. That includes this one right now, where we are going to be talking about Hanford, of course, the Hanford site there in Washington, outside of the Tri-Cities, very near the Columbia River, uh, someplace where a large number of nuclear materials have been processed for various use cases, whether it's defense or all over the board, really, for the government, uh, over decades, many, many, many decades. And because of all that, there is a lot of waste material there that is stored in underground tanks and various other ways that they have up there. Uh, the worry is that that could leak into the groundwater and that could also eventually lead to leaking into the Columbia River. Now, that's not what, ha what is happening right now, at, but there's a very concerted effort to figure out ways to clean that waste up. And that's what we're going to be talking about. On October 15th, the state of Washington and the federal government initiated a new way to clean that up, at least the low-activity waste uh, from the facility, by turning it into from liquid into glass. And so that's a very unique procedure that's also been decades in the making. So that's why it's such a big deal. And so we were able to speak to David Replug from Hanford Communities and TriDeck, which is an organization there for the Tri-Cities, uh, for Tri-Cities development but they work directly with the government Hanford site. I will say we asked the Hanford site, the federal government site, for an interview as well, and they were unable to do that, but they did refer me to David and said uh, he works directly with them and was able to talk about this. And so that's what this interview is about, just about the procedure itself, but then also what that means for the community and the region as a whole. So let's go into the interview here right now. David, thanks so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. You know, we want to talk about this new uh, program there at Hanford and how this is going to change things and really some of the history of that. Before we do that, would you mind just telling us about the organizations that you work for there in the Tri-Cities and how they interact with Hanford as a whole? Sure, Greg, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a part of two different organizations that are all that are both involved in uh, representing the community in the Tri-City area, which is a community of about 320,000 people who live right next to and downstream of the Hanford site. Uh, one of them being the Tri-City Development Council, or TRIDEC. And TRIDEC was actually formed in the early 1960s as the Tri-City's Nuclear Industrial Council uh, to advocate federally for the funding and policies needed to support support the Hanford mission, which at that time was plutonium production to support the national security during the Cold War. Um, over the years, it evolved into becoming more of a traditional economic development organization and changed its name in the 1980s to become the Tri-City Development Council, or TRIDEC. Um, and so now we do business retention, expansion efforts, things like that. Um, but with a, with a particular focus on energy and technology and innovation. Uh, but we've also maintained that federal focus where we work very closely with congressional offices, uh, with the Department of Energy, with um, the Hanford contractors, as well as with the state and the governor's office uh, in Washington uh, to support and advocate for Hanford cleanup. Uh, Hanford Communities, the other organization which I'm a part of, I serve as ex executive director for, and Hanford Communities represents directly the local governments in the Tri-City area on Hanford cleanup issues. And it was created in 1994. Uh, at that time, the plutonium production mission had come to an end at Hanford. Uh, and the Department of Energy was maybe having some challenges lifting the veil of secrecy that the site had operated under for decades up to that point. And local governments were really kind of struggling to get a sense of what was happening at Hanford, what the risks were, what the cleanup plan was, and they were all having to devote a significant amount of staff time and resources to kind of keeping track of what was happening. So they decided that it would probably make a lot more sense rather than, than duplicating efforts to create Hanford communities uh, which would represent and inform all the local governments and keep the local elected officials um, and the cities, counties, and ports that are involved informed about what was happening at Hanford. And then also we work to help ensure that the local community here in the Tri-Cities also is uh, informed about what's happening at Hanford too. Wow, so that's that's a lot that you're working on right there, but a lot of that uh, you know interaction there between the community. And have you found that communication between the the communities as a whole that are all part of those organizations with the actual Hanford federal site is is good? Has it been a, a good line of communication, I guess, between the two? 
Yeah, uh, especially compared to maybe where things were 30 years ago, communication between the community and the Department of Energy, the Hanford site, is really pretty good. Uh, there's a number of different public processes that any member of the public, not even just from the Tri-City area, but from the Northwest, from the country, can be involved in uh, reviewing documents, providing public comment, attending open houses, things like that. But uh, the, the folks at the Hanford site are generally very responsive if there are questions, if they're asked to present um, to a city council or to a group of folks representing the community. They do a pretty good job of, of sharing information and getting back to us in a pretty short turnaround time. Um, when it comes to this uh, big new cleanup effort, I mean, rather, it, it is a new cleanup effort, but this is a process that's been going on for a long time as far as getting it actually instituted. Can you tell us about what this big thing is that started there on, I believe, October 15th um, f for, for Hanford and, and how this all worked? Yeah, so the Hanford site, Hanford cleanup is just an incredibly complex and technically challenging effort as a whole. Um, the Hanford site is 580 square miles, so that's about half the size of Rhode Island for context. It's huge. Um, but the primary fo purpose for the Hanford site was to make plutonium, again, for America's national security mission. It ultimately produced about two-thirds of the nation's stockpile of plutonium. But as part of the process of making plutonium, you basically take this fuel that's gone through one of the nine reactors that operated out there, and then uh, they would need to chemically separate the actual plutonium from all the rest of the stuff. And the plutonium was just very a very small fraction of that total volume of material. And so generally speaking, what's in the Hanford tanks is all the other material that wasn't used for plutonium. And so that totals about 56 million gallons of, of waste that's stored in 177 underground tanks at the Hanford site. Some of the tanks are huge. They're up to a million gallons. Um, and so that tank waste has been sitting out there, some of it for upwards of 80 years since the Hanford site began, Hanford site began during the Manhattan Project in World War II. And so those tanks are getting old. And uh, some of the tanks have leaked in the past. And so that is a, a, a known risk to the environment. Thankfully, there's no immediate risks to public health or to the community right now. But everybody understands that ultimately the solution is you got to get that waste out of the tanks and into a more solid form. And so the big news is that uh, vitrification of Hanford's low activity tank waste has begun. Um, the Department of Energy and its contractor Bechtel uh, announced that last week. And what they do is essentially they take that waste out of the tanks, they pre-treat it, take all the higher, more highly radioactive materials out of it, and then the lower level waste, uh, both radioactivity as well as chemical waste, um, is then taken to the low activity waste vitrification facility. It's blended with glass forming materials and ultimately makes a solid glass column um, that is then in a much more stable form. It's not able to leach into the into the soil or into the groundwater, and that's how it will be permanently dispositioned. Um, and the the vitrified low activity waste will be stored permanently at the Hanford site in an engineered landfill there. Nice. Okay, so this they'll have a landfill where they'll take these giant glass cylinders of this radioactive material, radioactive or hazardous, whatever it may be. Um, waste material and then place it in those underground, uh, this underground um, uh, refuse place that they've created for it. And, and that's going to be, as you mentioned, a lot more stable. So the chances of something leaking is, is uh, much more, much less likely in that situation. Yeah, that, that's correct. And this has been done in partnership with the state of Washington. Uh, the Department of Ecology is the regulator for Hanford Cleanup. And that, uh, that solid glass form is a form that both the Department of Energy, the State Department of Ecology, and the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, have all agreed to as, the, as one of the optimal forms for um, treated tank waste to be um, stored in. And with these millions of gallons that are there currently that are going to be treated, how long will it take to go through all of those and treat everything? So the low activity waste vitrification facility is has only ever been intended to treat about half of 
Hanford's low activity tank waste. And again, we have about 56 million gallons of this tank waste at the Hanford site. Um, about five to 10% of that is high level waste. And then the remaining approximately 50 million gallons is low activity waste. And so the low activity waste vitrification facility will treat approximately 20 to 25 million. Uh, there's opportunities, some really exciting opportunities also to uh, get more of that low activity waste out of the tanks and grout it, meaning blending it with a concrete-like form. And that, again, becomes stable and not able to then leak into the, the soil. But at this point, the plan is for all of the grouted waste to be shipped permanently outside of Washington State to licensed landfills either in Utah or in Texas, where it would be stored permanently. So with the, if assuming both of those efforts are running at full capability, we're still probably looking at well over 10, maybe closer to 20 plus years before all of the low activity waste is out of the tanks. And then there's also still the high level waste, uh, high level tank waste, which um, will be treated at what's called the high level waste vitrific vitri vitrification facility, uh, which is still being uh, designed, engineered, and, and built right now, and is scheduled to go online in the early to mid 2030s. Gotcha. Okay, so there is a plan for the high-level stuff, but that's, yeah, as you mentioned, a, a little ways out there while they're working on that. Well, for, um, for you, you know, representing some of these communities and people around there, how do you feel about the fact that this process is going, and how does the community feel, I guess, about, you know, that there is these positive steps are being made toward rectifying some of these situations that are out there? Yeah, I think folks are really excited about this, this news. Um, Hanford is something that many members of our community are very familiar with. There's about 12,000 plus people who go to work every single day at the Hanford site, and nearly all of them live in the Tri-Cities. Um, and the vitrification plant has been under construction or some form of development for well over 20 years now. So uh, there are thousands and upon thousands of folks in our community that have contributed to um, uh, to getting to the point where we where we are now, where they're actually vitrifying the waste, um, and although there's again no sense of imp impending doom or concern about uh, health and safety to the community right now, we know that in the long term that is a, a major long term potential uh, challenge or concern, and so being proactive, working now to ensure that uh, it doesn't become a, a, a real problem in the future, um, and then also I, I think that. You know, the Department of Energy, again, the State Department of Ecology, who put a ton of time and effort into making this happen, and especially Bechtel, the contractor that built the low activity waste uh, vitrification facility, they've all put a lot of, uh, of, of skin in the game, and, and they've been working really hard to make this happen. So between the thousands upon thousands of folks in our community, um, ultimately, we really want the Hanford site to be safely effectively and efficiently cleaned up. And beginning of vitrification is a humongous step forward in making that a reality. Well, David, anything else that you think is important just for people to know, the general public to know about this process and about what's going on up there? I would just say again that Hanford cleanup is it's it's difficult. It's it's really challenging. The scope and the scale of it is unlike I think any other site in the country, maybe any other site in the world. And although again it's not scary in the sense that people need to be concerned about swimming in the river or uh, some immediate threat, but it is a big challenge. It's one of the federal government's largest single liabilities. And um, the, taking the steps that we take now, uh, the continued support from members of Congress like Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, Congressman Newhouse, uh, former Congressman Doc Hastings, who all have worked really hard to get us here, is really important. And it's going to take that continued support from all those folks, from the governor of Washington and, frankly, the, the, the governor and the congressional delegation from Oregon as well, um, and, and others, to continue to ensure that there's the adequate funding and policies needed to progress this mission forward. Because the longer it takes, um, the more it costs and the higher the likelihood of, of, of a potential risk or challenge in the future. Yeah, and something that if it's not taken care of, I mean, that doesn't just affect, you know, what's right there on the Hanford site. That's all over, you know, the, the entire Northwest, and really that could affect a lot of things, especially with the river there, too. Well, um, David, thank you very much, you know, for joining us here to, to talk about this and to go over this and just to shed a little bit of light on that, and it's great to get your um, your perspective on it too from the from the Hanford communities that are out there in Tridec and uh, yeah thanks for joining us here on Fox 12 now I really appreciate it thank you 
Uh, all right, so there we go. Uh, again, thank you to David for joining us for that interview and to, um, like I mentioned there at the end, to, to find out the perspective from the communities around there. And obviously, Hanford is uh, very important here for everybody in the Pacific Northwest because of what went on there and how the potential for danger is there. But going through these cleanup efforts and learning about that is uh, really, really valuable. Um, and if there's more information that we can get you, we absolutely will. So again, this is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. So wherever you're watching, whenever you're watching this, thanks for doing so. We are live streaming right now on Fox 12 Oregon's platforms. So if you're watching live, thanks. If you're not, download the Fox 12 Oregon app. It's a great way to do so. And that way, when there is breaking news, we'll come to you on there as well especially between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m., because that's what I'm in here. Uh, but we have more coming up this afternoon. We're going to talk to somebody from Investigative TV, one of the reporters there who did a report called uh, Doctors of Defense, the Whistleblower. They actually spoke to a whistleblower from the uh, Defense Health Agency and about some very concerning things that are going on there when it comes to their practices. So we'll have that full story and an interview with the reporter coming up here shortly on Fox 12 Now. And like I mentioned, if there's breaking news, we'll have that as well. But we'll go ahead and uh, take a break for right now. I will talk to you soon. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is.